a while back, uh, I, I have uh, worked the last five years with the OpenGL Architectural Review Board and been a part of designing OpenGL 2.0 and also 3.0, which is coming out now, and the OpenGL shading language. And um, I heard some talk about the state of OpenGL and what it's like in Blender. And I just hinted to Tan some of the things you could do to speed it up. And Tan became sort of upset and said, why isn't anybody telling us all this? Why, isn't, why don't we know how to make Blender faster? And I said, good question, um, because I haven't told you guys. So therefore, we put together this session where I'm now going to tell you guys how to make Blender a whole lot faster. Uh, I actually took the opportunity to search through the uh, source code of Blender to see which OpenGL calls are used in Blender. And to my horror, I could say that uh, by porting over to some more modern standards, we could easily get Blender to run 10 times as fast. So this is really something to look into. Imagine having 10 times faster computers. And then think of that. So uh, this is a rendering engine uh, that uses Verse. And if you're interested in Verse, um, go to the Verse session, which is tomorrow. We're also going to be showing uh, a 10-minute show in the big screen about uh, using Verse and Blender. But the reason why I wanted to do just take this is because this contains a little rendering engine that I've written. And it's completely hardware-accelerated 3D rendering. So you can see here, we have some really cool shaders. We have a displacement mapping shader. We have a reflectant shader that actually reflects different colors depending on, on uh, angle. We have a reflective ball. And we have a ramp here. We have a multi-textured object. We got a plane, um, just a color, kind of boring, but hey. Uh, we have a shaded ball, a uh, normal sort of lit ball. And here's a fun material that I like, which is a negative ball, which is a white ball that gets uh, darker when you put light on it. So on the bright side, it's actually black. And this is all done using OpenGL uh, shading language. This shader is probably my favorite. This is actually a refracting ball of sort of some sort of glass, but it actually refracts refracts red, green, and blue differently. So you can see it sort of breaks light and creates this sort of weird color effect. And what I wanted to prove with this, just you know, starting off my talk showing some graphics because it's more fun, is that you can do some really amazing stuff with hardware nowadays, and not doing it is really stupid. And some people think this is just pre-computed or something like that. It's not. Let's actually do something. Let's. Uh, click on this ball, and here we have a schematic of the shader. You can go into the shader and say, okay, I want to change the color of it. And you, it's all real time. And let's add some more stuff. Uh, I can't read from here. Uh, where are we? There's actually a new function I'm going to use. It's just right here. So now I can do multiply by another color, which is really boring. Let's actually jump out of this one because it's such a boring material. And have a look at, for instance, this one. It's a more fun material. So here we have a, a light that is multiplied by a color. I'm getting some feedback here. OK, so I can change the color of the sphere. I can add some color in here, uh, over there. Uh, actually, that was turned out to be multiplied. But I can now uh, have sort of an ambient term here. Uh, let's change that one to add. Now we got a super ugly green <laughs> ambient term. So let's pull that one down and make it sort of a bluish hue. OK, so now I have a back which is sort of, well, it doesn't really get black anymore because we have this ambient. Uh, over here, we have a material that has a ramp on it. And the ramp it looks like this, but I've set it to a mode that is just 
a stripe. So let's change that to something more fun. Let's change it to linear. And we'll see this get sort of smooth surface. And go back in our view and see. Well, that looks a little bit better. Let's see if we can just clear the. Uh, here we can look at the displacement mapping. Um, let's have a look at that material. I'm going to try to position it on screen somehow, like that. And now we can look at the, uh, I think this is actually the displacement map. Uh, yeah. So I can start modifying the displacement map. And you can see it's all real time as well. So, uh, wow, this, this is a negative one. Cool. Uh, well, that's just my short demo of, of what's possible. So, um, starting to look at OpenGL more seriously is really, you know, beyond just drawing lines and, and, and polygons on screen. You can do some amazing stuff. So, uh, now I'm going to end my fun part and going to talk about the boring parts. So, I'm actually going to uh, quit the entire machine. I can, you can turn off the projector even. So, I'm going to bring out my notes, which is my second laptop. I have two. So, um, uh, a mouse pointer somewhere. So, um, let's see where we are. There we go. So, uh, OpenGL has changed quite a lot uh, over 10 years. The bad thing is that nothing has been deprecated. So the oldest stuff is still there. And the big change is that back in the days, drawing was really expensive. So the CPU was really fast and the graphics card was really slow. So back then you could send 100 commands and then draw something and that would be fine. Today you can't do that because the CPU and the driver has to uh, is so much slower than the, the graphics card that when you actually give something to the graphics card, you got to gr give it a whole lot of stuff at the same time. Otherwise, you're screwed, right? It, OpenGL, this is not really good, but it's not as bad as, as in DirectX. In DirectX, you have roughly 50 draw commands in your screen. After that, you've sort of run out of processing time. So you can only draw 50 objects. And if you want to draw 51 objects, you've got to draw one object as two objects. Um, so so um, that's really what you've got to think about all the time. How many calls am I making? How many, um, how many state changes am I doing? And try to minimize that. And um, OpenGL is very large. So you need to have a strategy for choosing what to use. And there is a whole lot of extensions out there. I think there's over 100 different extensions for OpenGL. And how do you figure out which ones to use? Well, you should use the stuff that are the newest stuff. You should use the stuff that, is, uh, ARB, uh, that has the extension ARB, which means that all the companies in the architectural review board together have decided this is a good thing. Not just NVIDIA, not just ATI, but all of them. Uh, another thing to look at is, is see if there's any other uh, extensions talking about the, talking about the same thing um, that, that has been um, coming out since the, the extension you're looking at. So if you're looking at a geometry extension, for instance, and you realize there's another geometry extension coming out two years after that, that's probably better. So. Um, what I've done is that I've compiled a list, which um, I'll send out a document that will be on the blender.org website um, where you can read you know, more extensively about this. Um, where is a number of, of, of basic uh, things to use in OpenGL. Some, you know, some of the most, uh, some of the best extensions for doing the basic things. So, um, Let's talk through some, some areas of, of problems. The first one is geometry. How do you get as much geometry as possible onto your graphics card? Well, the AGP or PCI Express uh, bus is always slow. Uh, 
whatever bus you have, even if you have the fastest, newest bus, it's gonna be slow. So you need to minimize that. And the first thing you should never, ever, ever do is use immediate mode. Immediate mode is actually, you know, it's, it's really the worst thing you can do. There's actually a guy from, ATI, uh, from, from Intel who wrote a paper on how impossible it is from a driver's point of view to optimize uh, uh, immediate mode. For instance, at any time in immediate mode, you can do crazy things. You can start uh, copying from other data. You can do, yes, question? Yeah, immediate mode is when you start with uh, GL begin and then end with GL end. And in between there you have GL vertex, GL color, GL normal, GL text cord, and all those commands. But since there are so many, and you can choose when to, to do them and when not to do them, it's completely impossible for the driver to, to guess what you're gonna do. So if you actually need to have functionality like that, if you, for instance, do a particle system, where a particle system is really hard to quantify how large it's gonna be, because it's growing and it's make, becoming shorter and particles die and particles are created dynamically. So you might not know how long, how much uh, geometry you wanna draw, so you might not wanna allocate memory for that. Well, what you should do that is allocate memory anyway. Start by the first, uh, vertex, build up your allocation. When you re come to the end of your buffer, draw that buffer and start over. And by doing that, you actually draw the same buffer over and over and over again, but you do it with one call. Because it's much easier for you to build one array and know what you need to have in that array. You need to have color and you need to have vertex, but you don't need to have normal, for instance. And you know that, but the GL driver doesn't know that. So if you use immediate mode, it's going to always be like, maybe there's a normal command coming any second. Maybe I have to think about that. So the driver has to do a lot of things just because the, the, uh, the application could potentially do something really stupid. So therefore, always use arrays. There is never, ever a reason to use immediate mode. And when you use arrays, there are two types of arrays. Either you draw just an array, or you draw, draw an indexed array. That's when you have an array, and then you have a second array that says, I wanna use this vertex, then this vertex, then this vertex, then this vertex. This array is very nice, because you can reuse the same data over and over again. So if there's one vertex in a corner of a, 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 a cube, it's gonna be used by three different surfaces, right? So you can reuse that vertex, and that saves memory but it also saves processing because the hardware can actually cache that. It can compute one vertex, and then when it realizes that the next polygon is using the same vertex, it can use that because it's already computed that. So using uh, vertex arrays and using index vertex arrays is very important. In the, uh, vertex arrays can be used in many different ways. Uh, if you have a color array and then a vertex array, uh, you can either have two separate pieces of memory and say, here's my vertex array, and here's my color array, and go draw. But what you can also do is give little gaps in these. So what you can actually do is use the same array, and every other uh, piece of data is color, and every other piece of data is vertex. And the smart thing about that is that when you interleave your data like that, the caching system in the hardware works much, much better because it starts reading in this chunk of memory and puts it in the cache, and then it fetches the vertex data, and then it, when it goes to, to fetch the actual color data, it realizes, oh, it's already in the cache because physically it's on the same place in the memory. Uh, vertex arrays has been around for uh, forever. Uh, it's from GL 1.1. You'll be hard pressed to find hardware out there that can't support it. So, from my point of view, that should be your lowest end, you know. And if you really, really, really want to support old, old hardware that's so old that you can't really run Blender, then you can actually write some sort of wrapper around immediate mode. Yes? Yeah, it's 1.2. Six years ago, you would still find the Yeah. Six years ago. Yeah. I would say that one, one, 1. 1.2, uh, 
was out at a point where graphics card started to appear on, on the PC. Before that, version 1.0 or 1.1 was weird graphics stations like, uh, well, you know, HP stations and, and Evanson Sutherlands and, you know, things we don't know about anymore because nobody has them, right? Any NVIDIA card, you know, NVIDIA wasn't around when, you know, uh, 1.1 was out. ATI wasn't around by then. So any card that, you know, you would know of has these features. So, um, um, quick question. yeah? Yeah, they, they are the same. They, 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 they don't support, uh, they support these features in the API, but they don't always have all the things in hardware. But the drivers are still doing it. And it's, it's, actually, it's actually not trying to make the hardware go faster. It's, it's usually trying to get the driver go faster. Because every time you do something in GL, if you send a vertex, you might send a vertex at any time, right? outside a begin and end call. So every time you call that, it, start, it has to start by looking at what am I in, in what state am I? Am I inside of a begin and end call? It might be a completely stupid thing to you know, call it outside of those two, but it still has to check. It still has to throw an error if you do that. So that means that it has to check all these states that is completely ridiculous, that never, never happens. But it says in some spec from the 80s that if this and this happens, you have to throw an error. So it has to have that error mechanism built in for all these commands. And that makes it incredibly slow today when we have so fast graphics card that all that tiny error checking that didn't really matter in the 80s is really, really killing us today. So how should I, okay, vertex arrays are really old. Aren't there any better ways to do this, something really fast, something really good? Yes, there is, and it's called vertex buffer objects. And what it basically is, is that you tell GL that I wanna have a pointer to an object in the graphics memory. So you get a piece of memory that sits on the graphics card, and then you can put your vertex arrays in that and then draw with it. The negative side of that is that it's a bit slow to actually read and write from that memory. It's because you have to send it over the bus. But once you've sent it over the bus, it's over there, and you can draw with it a thousand times and it'll always be fast. Uh, when you actually bind a vertex buffer, there is this tiny problem, and that's that binding a vertex buffer can be slow. But since you can have a huge memory buffer and then say, I want to have one array for one object over here and then one object over here and one ob object over here, you can actually just have one vertex buffer that's really large and all your objects are mapped inside of that and you can make some memory or, you know, system that keeps track of that. So allocate them in really large chunks. And if they become too small, free them and allocate new ones. And that's how you easily just handle large sets of data like that. Things to think about, uh, when you, for instance, do a blend or something like that in, in Vertex, say, say you want to have an arm and it's uh, influenced by this data and that data from this uh, bone and that bone and this bone, and you know, you have a lot of envelopes and things that contribute to one single Vertex and you want to know where that is. You could usually do something like you have the Vertex data and then you add influence from this, and then you add from that. And every time you add the stuff, you have to read out the, the memory, add something, and read it back. And that goes over the bus. So it's much better to have a temp variable with that data in, and once you've actually computed the final data, put it into the memory. So that's something you have to think about when you uh, do vertex arrays, that the memory is actually slower, but it's faster for the graphics card. So uh, there is one even faster way of doing it, and that's display lists. And display lists is basically just recording what you're doing on OpenGL and saying, I'm gonna to wanna to do this again. The bad thing about that is that you've recorded a piece of state that is static. So if not, something changes, you can't change it, right? You have to redo it. When recording, there's two modes, either record and record and execute, which means draw and record. Don't use that. Use just record. If you want to record and execute, just record and then execute once you've recorded. That's usually actually faster. So do it in two steps. 
Um, that has to do with weird, you know, optimization inside of drivers. I don't actually understand exactly why, but I've been told a lot of times. Other things to do is to, if you uh, build a uh, uh, display list, to build a complete display list with everything in them, all the state that you need. Uh, because some people think they're really smart and they make a display list from just all their vertex array, uh, vertex commands, but they leave out the actual begin command because then they can just say begin and then draw this vertex array, which is all the commands between begin and end. And then they think they're really smart because they can change the, the type of the begin, if it's a begin line or vertex, without redoing the, the, um, the, the actual display list. This is absolutely terrible because you can add an extra vertex array call before, which means that all the triangles are now different because you have three vertices for one triangle. And if you outsync those, right, not the same vertices become triangles anymore because, right, you, you, you start by syncing them. So that can completely screw up and you can be back to having something that is even slower than, than immediate mode. So you have to actually check that what you're doing is smart. If you think you've come up with this super smart idea, test it and, and make sure that it really is a smart idea. Because a lot of the most stupid ideas are people thinking they're smart. You have to predict that the driver manufacturer has to think the same way as you are because that's how they can optimize for what you're doing. They're trying to pre predict your behavior. So doing really stupid things and, and weird things is bad, okay? So, uh, next I'm gonna talk a, bit, a little bit about shaders. Uh, hardware today is built on shaders. Uh, you may think that OpenGL is a fixed function pipeline. You set a bunch of parameters and you get something out on the other end and you can read in a book what, what happens, all the math that goes on, all the transform and lighting, and how that works. It doesn't work like that anymore. It's a completely programmable thing that sits in there. And that means that not programming it is actually a waste of, of cycles. Because it has to go through a very complex pipeline that maybe doesn't have to be as complex because you might want to do something else. So specifying what you actually really, really want to do makes it faster. So more freedom, more programmability, and faster performance all in one. So this is really a win-win situation. So how do I make shaders? Well, it used to be that you have to do uh, like programming on a really low level and you gave a stream of, of, of commands that were like um, assembly programming style. And that's pretty much dead. So don't do that. There is a beautiful G uh, shading language called the GLSL, uh, GLSL, which is a GL shading language. And it's a C-like language that's very simple to use. And you can do whatever you want with it. It's extremely flexible and extremely nice. So use that. It's similar to CG and, and HLSL on the DirectX side. And it's supported by pretty much everybody. It's, on, it's in Linux, it's in, in, uh, on the Mac, it's on, on, uh, on Windows, of course. So uh, it really is something that you should use. And what I suggest doing is actually build a system where you can compile your own shaders. Because one of the great things about the GL shading language is that the compiler is in the driver. If you use CG, you have to write CG in a file, give it to a compiler, which is a command line tool, and you get out some thing, some piece of data, and then you give that state to, to the driver and says, draw this. But in GL, you can actually give a pointer to the text in the program when the program is running. So you saw my demo over there. I'm actually generating the source code for those shaders by building a tree. So the tree I'm building is, is an artist's representation of how they think about you know, materials and things like that. And then I have code that takes that and makes it into source code in GLSL, gives it to the driver, says compile this, link it, and now I want to display this object with this material, with this shader. And then you can see it in real time. So the shaders you saw that were not written by me, I wrote a program that wrote the shaders. 
And that's a really good approach for making programs that are extremely flexible and extremely fast. And that comes, to, we're, here we come to an interesting point. A lot of people think uh, when they start writing shaders, they write one Uber shader. And an Uber shader is a shader that does everything. And then you have a bunch of if statements in it that says, well, if I want to use a colored shader, do this. And if I want to use a lit shader, do this. So I have if statements sort of branching out to different types of shader that I want. And then I compile this one shader, and all I have to do is set some state that sort of, I built my own state machine basically, right? With switches where I want to have them and I can just do everything. This is really bad because what happens is that the switches take a lot of time. And it's much, much better to say up front, I'm only going to do this. Here's the shader for it. And when I'm going to do something else, I'm going to give you a different shader. So it's good to have many, many shaders instead of having one shader or few shaders that can do everything. Uh, so for instance, a good example is how many light sources should you compute? Well, you might want to have a parameter in your shader that says how many light sources. And then you have a loop that goes through all the, all the light sources and compute each and every one and adds them together. But it's much better, actually, to compile a shader that has just one light source, and then another one that has two shaders in it, and then another one that has three shaders in it. And depending on how many light sources you want, you switch shaders instead. And this is much, much more effective, especially since a lot of the drivers unroll their loops. So if you have a loop with three uh, uh, light sources, it will actually not be a loop. It will be the same computation three times over. So that's a much, much more effective way of doing it. So really what I'm saying here is get a handle on shading. And since shading is kind of cool, I thought that I would give a little course in it. Tomorrow I'm going to have, we're going to have a, a, a Blender uh, uh, a verse session, a verse developer session. And anybody who's interested in, in GL uh, shading language should come to that and I'll give a little pr presentation, a little intro at the end of that. And I'll show my applications, and I'll show my source code. I'll, I'll get you started if you're interested in, in that. So, um, so next is, is render surfaces. I know that at render, uh, Blender uh, renders to the front buffer and that's really bad. And there's a whole bunch of different old ways of rendering to texture, like you use text image copy and things like that to do things. And those are incredibly slow, so don't ever use them. And drawing to front buffer screws up the hardware acceleration a lot. So if you need to draw to a texture or, you know, draw something on top of something you've already drawn, or do compositing where you have, you know, you want to draw this image and draw that image. You want to use these two images as textures in a shader to create image next one. Or you want to blur the shaders. You want to do anything where you go from, from image to image to image like that. You should use an extension called uh, frame buffer objects. And frame buffer objects is a fairly new extension that has been around for maybe a year and a half. But it's, ex it's supported by everybody and it can do everything you want, and it's really, really fast. And there's also an extra one called Frame Buffer Blit, which is an extension to the extension that allows you to copy data really, really fastly. So if you, you need to have one image that gets copied into two to do two different processing on them, Frame Buffer Blit is the one to use. Um, yeah? About the front buffer, the history, Yeah. Yeah. Turn it on, and to copy the button. The problem is there is still 
um, um, a minuscule but still relevant amount of systems that use the buff swap exchange system. And I still didn't have the answer how to enforce these systems to use swap copy, what we call it. And it's, uh, in the workstation market, but also the 3D labs, you know these cards? They're yeah. the more professional cards. You can tweak them, but the problem is you don't have a runtime command not that I know of in OpenCL to tell I want to have a window using the swap copy system and not the swap exchange. Yeah. It seems to be some external setting yeah. in the card, and then it will work or not. Well, well actually, in, in, uh, in Windows, the surface cannot actually be displayed, which is the one you're drawing to. It has to be copied, uh, which is kind of weird. But you can't actually display the actual, the actual data that you're rendering to cannot be the one that been sent out through the cord of your graphics card. It has to be copied to a specific place. And that's a Windows limitation for some reason, but you know. I can just tell you about render to texture that I started about five years ago in the ARB architectural review board, and then they started, then they almost finished an uh, extension called render to texture. And then they realized that that wasn't good enough, so they designed the, uh, the uh, super buffers, and then uh, they designed that for about two years, and they didn't realize did, that didn't work, so they started the Uber Buffer project, and the Uber Buffer project didn't work out. Uh, that took about two years, and then they actually went back to the frame buffer object, which after about t another you know, year and a half, actually uh, it was finished. But frame buffer objects is, is not g good enough. So they actually decided to scrap pretty much entire OpenGL because of this. And this is now the new object model that will be OpenGL 3.0. And OpenGL 3.0 is actually based on the problems that arise when you try to render to texture. So this is, this is something that's really, you know, this is a point that's been argued a lot about. And there's a lot of issues. But frame buffer objects is actually pretty good. And you can use it. So use it. And the things that come in the future will be very similar, but I'll talk about that in a second. Yeah. Uh, but, um, all of the current 3D systems I know that I know that ATI does, and I know that Intel does, and I know that uh, uh, NVIDIA does. And that's pretty much, you know, you're hard pressed to find any other manufacturers no, of open Yeah, I, th I, you know, yeah, yeah. I, I would, I would say this. Uh, you can write your own backup system for uh, d dealing with this with uh, text image copy, and then it will be slow, right? But pretty much, uh, even old graphics cards can do this. This is not a new feature in hardware. This is a new feature in the driver. That's actually where the problem is. So really, really old graphics card with, you know, that has updated its driver in the last year will work pretty good. Uh, it's not actually that they invented any new magic hardware. It's just, you know, they've always been able to do this. It's just, you know, how do we describe it in the API in a way that doesn't break everything? And I, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a, in a second. I'm probably out of time soon, so. Oh. Yeah. Okay, soonish. So texture formats, you know, there's a lot of weird texture formats. Try not to use the weird ones, you know, uh, GL 10, 10, 10, or, you know, 10, 10, 10, 2, or, you know, the, the ones that are weird. Don't do that. RGB, RGBA, really good ones. And there are two that I want to push for, and that's a float RGB, which allows you to do, renders the float buffer. And there is another one, uh, well, I guess there's two of those. There is the float buffer and there's a half float, which is only supported on NVIDIA hardware. But uh, since it's usually so easy just to detect, uh, do I have it? And then you switch one value from another, you know, you know supporting a texture format is just having a token that you give when you create your, uh, your textures and switching that out for something else. And that, therefore, I think it's good enough that you can actually support only NVIDIA hardware because it's so easy to, to write a backup for other systems. 
because on NVIDIA hardware, half the floats are, are less precise, but a lot faster. So uh, think about that. And another way, if you really have a problem with textures, there is the S3 uh, texture compression format, which is also supported by all hardware out there. And it gives you about a ratio to one to eight, I think eight times as much texture RAM. You get a little bit of uh, quality loss, but you know, enough to make it worth it. Um, so, um, so quickly I want to go through a, a list of caveats and, and things that you might, um, uh, might miss. Uh, so for instance, uh, don't use feedback mode. I know that Blender does. And feedback mode is the ability to read back things. Good, okay. Yeah, select. Uh, well, that's something that you actually think is hardware-based, but it's not. And especially if you use it um, with draw commands, it can be very slow. So it can actually slow things down. So try not to use select or actually implement it yourself by drawing something. You can like, if you're selecting objects, you can draw each object in a co different color and then just check the color of a certain pixel. You know, you can, you can make a, a, an image that is one pixel large and then draw your entire scene and see what color that pixel becomes. That's a way of getting around it. But uh, usually you can do some smart things because you know the bounding boxes so you can sort of throw away a lot of things because you know that, you know, it's not going to hit that anyway. So uh, that's, you know, if you think you're doing something smart and using the hardware, you're probably not. You're using software. You know, and the, the guy who implemented that is, is, is not the most optimizing guy, you know, and, and he doesn't know what you guys are doing, so he's going to do a really terrible job. Um, uh, let's see, as few calls as possible, we talked about that all the time. Okay, GL state. This is an impossible thing to, to live up to, but don't switch GL state ever. <laughs> is the idea, that's what the driver people want. But some state is more expensive than other state. And the things I want to mention is switching frame buffer object, what you're drawing to is usually expensive. Switching a, a vertex buffer object is usually expensive, where you take your data. Switching a program, if you're using shaders, is usually expensive. So you might want to sort for that. If you have 10 objects that are drawing uh, using the same uh, shader, draw them all at once, and you don't have to switch back and forth. Um, it's not always possible, because the rule is also that you want to draw from, the f from close to far away. Because if we draw on a pixel, and then you have Z buffer mapping, and then you draw something behind, uh, the hardware can actually figure out, oh, this is not going to show up, because there's Z buffer. So then it doesn't have to compute that uh, shader on that pixel. So it can actually make a speed up by drawing things that are not vis visible. So, you know, there's argument all over in which order to draw things, but. Um, you can actually do one thing, which is to draw a C uh, pass, with just, just C buffer, and then draw everything on top of that. Because then you know that you will never draw on a pixel that will not be visible, because everything will be tested against a Z buffer. And that's good if you have shaders that are extremely, you know, take a lot of time and you don't want to spend a lot of time shading pixels that are not going to be used. It's a trick, but I'm not sure too many people do, do it. A backface calling is essentially free on all hardware, so always do that if you can. Uh, smoothing lines uh, looks really good and is really neat, but if you use it together with shading, it usually breaks and the driver switched to a software mode, which is incredibly slow. So be careful about smooth lines. You might have, you know, it might work on your computer, but it might get unbelievably slow on some other computers. Yes? You can use textures, yes. Uh, but they are, the thing is that to do uh, smooth lines in hardware, they actually use textures. So they have a, a little program that does that for you. And if you try to make a smooth line with a program in it, that collides with their program doing the smoothing, right, with the texturing. And therefore, it's, it's almost impossible to run a shader while you're drawing 
a, a line that has anti-aliasing. If you don't have anti-aliasing, you can have shading on your line. If you don't have shading, if you just you know, draw a colored line, single color, you, know, you can have all the anti-aliasing you want. Just be, be afraid of having both at the same time. You, you can get smooth lines by drawing multiple transparent lines. And that's even faster than having the smooth option. Yeah. That's what I found out too. Yeah. So you set blend on and you draw a normal line. And then in half a pixel to the left up and half a pixel to the right, that's a little bit jittering around. And if you draw it five times, you get a nice smooth line. Even for curves and all kinds of stuff. I ask you, what do you know about the, uh, the future of the arc buffer or off-screen rendering? Is that the frame buffer object? Yeah, that's, that's frame buffer objects. OK, that's the same. Yeah. Um, always try to make your shaders use as little memory as possible. And this is a really tricky area. Because the thing is that you can query the hardware how much uh, memory you have in your shader. But that's never true. Because as it turns out, the shader uses uh, memory itself. The, so for instance, if you're calling a function like uh, square root, right? that square root might actually, in hardware, become a texture lookup. And that means you just lost a texture unit, because the texture unit was assigned to doing that math operation. And you can query how many, uh, how many texture units you have, but all of a sudden, you lost one. What happened? And you switched to software, right? And you don't know whether the hardware you're going to run to is going to cheat and use a texture unit to do this, a lookup in a table, or whether it actually has the math capabilities to compute it, right? So therefore, uh, beware of some of the math functions if you're cutting it close, because those might actually be texture units and things like that. And try to leave as much room as possible. Don't have a lot of you know, variables and textures you're not using and things like that. And especially, this is a problem if you're doing Uber shaders. You're going to allocate a lot of memory, and then you're just going to switch to something and do something completely different and not use all that thing. And that means that it might work on your machine, but this different driver doing uh, a little bit different of optimization might just crawl to adapt and be, be in software. Um, Try to move as much as possible from the fragment shader into the vertex shader, because the vertex shader is usually a lot less busy. That's a tip that can help you a lot. Um, the noise functional in GLSL is really not implemented anywhere. It really is implemented in, in, uh, in the ATI driver. Uh, but it's so slow and so complex that as soon as you use it, it switches into software mode. So it's completely useless. On NVIDIA, they just output gray, because that's the mid-noise mid color in their world. So you get no noise whatsoever. So if you need noise, do a texture. It's just, you know, maybe in a few years it'll work. It doesn't work now. So another thing, uh, if you're unsure about what you're supposed to do, talk to NVIDIA, talk to ATI, talk to Intel, and talk to Apple. Apple writes their own drivers. If you you're buying an ATI Mac. You're not getting drivers from ATI. You're getting them from Apple. And that's kind of strange because you know, when you're buying a PC, you're not getting the drivers from Microsoft. You're getting it from the hardware guys. But on the Mac, it's like that. So you know, exact same uh, uh, circuitry might work differently in a Mac on a PC. Yes? A actually, ATI does write their own Mac drivers. You just have to download them separately. So, uh, so they have they have they have uh, open drivers team and OpenGL developers that are pretty cool. But they do answer questions. At least that's not always the case with Apple. So yeah. Well, I, I found I found some problems there. So um, there is a GLE debugger that is very useful, and and uh, if you. Uh, if you talk to them, you can actually get free licenses for a year for non-commercial. I've already talked about them about, about Blender, and they would love to give uh, to developers uh, using Blender. Um, and you can also send the actual software to the hardware vendor to make them do profiles on it. And then they will tell you exactly what you're doing wrong. Uh, I would start working on Blender before I do that, if I were you. Uh, and of course, always profile. 
Um, quickly, do I have a few more minutes? 30 seconds. 30 seconds. That's no way I can. I have ten, five minutes, please. Okay. Uh, well, <laughs> this is really impossible. But uh, next year uh, at SIGGRAPH, there's going to be OpenGL 3.0. And short with OpenGL 3.0 is throwing away a lot of the basic structure of OpenGL and creating a new API. And what it allows you to do is have immutable objects, which means if you create a texture, for instance, you create it with a size and a format, and that can never change. You can never make a mess of it. You have to delete it and create a new texture. And the same goes with programs. If you create a program, you can't change the code in that program. And that means that things that are bound in OpenGL can't change unless you unbound them. So for instance, today, if you have a frame buffer object, which is a thing that says, I want to draw to this thing, and then you point to a texture, which is the color buffer, and then another thing, which is the depth buffer, and then you draw to this thing, and you can validate this thing and say, do these two fit together? And it says, yeah, it fits together. But then just when you're supposed to draw, it has to check that all over again, because maybe you took that uh, texture and said, nah, just let's change the bit depth to something completely different, because you can change it at any time. So that means that every, every time you draw with this, you have to check that you, know, you haven't gone around doing something stupid. And that's all taken away in, in OpenGL 3.0. So in OpenGL 3.0, you have a, a, a atomic create command, it's called. You have one call that creates an entire texture. And the thing you give to that call can't be changed ever. It's set in stone. And that means that the hardware can allocate memory for it and put it into place where it should be and never ever is the user going to mess with it. There's also a counter in it, which means that if you delete a, ver uh, a texture that you're bound, that texture won't go away until you unbound it. And that means that the, the, the hardware doesn't have to be, every time you draw something, you have to check that all the bound textures are still there. Because today you can bind the texture and just delete it. So every time you draw with a texture, the hardware has to check that the actual texture is still there. And that's very slow. And that's all going away in, in OpenGL 3.0. So what I would do if, if I were building something today, which I guess I am already, is build for this way of thinking. Don't uh, change your data. Create data, and if you don't like it, throw it away, create new data. Because that's how the driver is going to look, and that's how the technology is going to look. This is going to be out in SIGGRAPH 2007, and there's probably going to be more information on this uh, at the, the Game Developers Conference. If you look at papers and all the notes from the OpenGL BOF at SIGGRAPH, you can find a lot of notes on, on how this system will work. But this is a major change in OpenGL, and it will you know, not really change uh, Feature-wise, what you can do, it will just make the API a lot cleaner and a whole lot faster. So starting to think in those, you know, in that area is a really good way of, of moving applications forward. Uh, I guess they're going to kill me if I continue now. So thank you. And please. Uh, since we're really short on time, please come up and talk to me if you want to know more. And uh, on the open, uh, on the Verse Dev uh, session, yes, tomorrow I'll show some more stuff, and we can, you know, we'll have a soft place where we can talk. So. Uh, did you put your notes online? Uh, I have not. I have them here. I wrote them on the plane here, but they're done. So I'll send them uh, out now, and we'll have them on the website by right. tonight. Okay. So. Thank you. So, all right, um, we now are going to have two uh, workshops in the two rooms. Uh, this is a workshop slash presentation, so it's not so much hands-on, but it is kind of workshoppy style. And this is uh, creating games using Blender, Crystal Space, and Blender to Crystal.